This is Wisdom Anime Recap. This means war. The story begins in the depths of Diamandra, a fortress-like prison where Michiko Malandro slipped through the shadows, leaving behind an empty cell. When an unsuspecting officer, carrying out a routine check, stumbled upon her absence, panic ensued as the alarms blared. The guards rushed towards the tumultuous cries of the captive horde. Amidst the chaos, Michiko fell upon one of the guards, stealing his gun. Outside the confines of her captivity, Michiko's desperate flight led her towards a helicopter. Bullets danced in the air as she unleashed her wrath upon her pursuers, the helicopter ultimately meeting its fiery demise, crashing into a colossal wind turbine. Meanwhile, in the peaceful morning haze, Hanna Morenos ventured back to her church-turned-home. The weight of her existence burdened her soul as she prepared omelets for her heartless foster family. With trembling hands, she presented the food to her foster parents, but her foster father's eyes fell upon burnt eggs. Without remorse, he discarded the meal, commanding Hana to start anew. As the family sat down to eat, the foster father uttered a hollow prayer. The foster brother's twisted amusement took flight as he launched his food at Hana. Far from the reaches of this cruel scene, Michiko prowled the dimly lit streets, where she seized a morsel from the grasp of a homeless man. As Hana scrubbed the floor, her foster sister sauntered over, malicious mischief glinting in her eyes. With a vicious flick, she carelessly hurled a filthy mop bucket directly at Hana. In a bid to salvage her clothing, she ventured outside to let them dry, only to find her foster brother sitting up on a tree. He launched a barrage of rocks aimed at her defenseless figure. Yet, in a bizarre twist of fortune, Hana's hand instinctively caught one of the projectiles from the air. Emboldened by his failed attempt, her foster brother descended from his perch, launching a merciless kick that sent Hana sprawling to the ground. Upon discovering the sodden rug, the foster mother's ire surged. But Hana stepped forward as the scapegoat, to which the foster mother condemned her to the confines of a desolate room. In a moment of respite, Hana sought solace within the sanctuary of a bath, her heart heavy with defeat. Then, the flow of water abruptly ceased. An agonizing realization struck her as she drew back the shower curtains. Her clothes had vanished. Clad in nothing but a towel, Hana trudged toward her room. Then a specter materialized before her in the dimly lit corridor, the foster sister. Her visage twisted into a malicious smile as she tried to remove Hana's towel. But Hana fought tooth and nail to retain her soul shred of dignity. Alas, her defiance incited an eruption of violence, culminating in the foster sister mercilessly pushing her down the treacherous descent of stairs. Elsewhere, Michiko stormed into a bank, her eyes ablaze. She aimed her weapon at the teller's glass and pulled the trigger. The commotion drew the attention of the police, who rushed in with guns drawn, hoping to put an end to the madness. But Michiko was not one to go down without a fight. She unleashed a torrent of bullets towards the officers and forced them to surrender their weapons. With a cold glare, Michiko turned her attention back to the trembling bank teller. Her voice dripped with venom as she threatened to unleash unspeakable violence if the terrified employee didn't fill her duffel bag with cash. Satisfied with her plunder, Michiko made her escape. Then, as she reached the exit, Michiko turned around and aimed her gun at a pursuing cop. But to her dismay, the trigger only clicked, devoid of ammunition. So she dropped the useless weapon and fled. Back in the dimly lit chapel of the church, Hana's foster father presented her with a stack of books. Quoting Leviticus, he twisted scripture to his advantage, reminding her of the hardships faced by foster children, insinuating that she should be grateful for the supposed benevolence bestowed upon her by God and by extension himself. Hana felt her self-worth diminish as she perceived these books as a payoff for the abuse she received. When a social worker arrived to provide the foster family with child support, Hana maintained the facade of a contented child. This charade continued as they all sat down to share a meal, their false smiles masking the truth beneath. Finally, when the social worker departed, the foster mother's true colors emerged. Her discontent with the funds became painfully evident, and when the family cat brushed against her legs, he was met with a swift kick. She then handed a mysterious sack to Hana, instructing her to dispose of it. But as the woman left the room, the sack emitted a soft meow. The morning sun had begun to rise when Hana embarked on her monotonous chore of scrubbing the dishes. As she toiled, the foster brother sauntered in and brazenly inquired about the whereabouts of the family cat. A sly remark slipped from the foster mother's lips, insinuating that Hana was the last to see him. 
With a mixture of guilt and despair, Hana averted her eyes. In a grotesque display befitting her alleged crime, Hana was reduced to the likes of a lowly beast, her back used as a makeshift saddle, a crude rope choking her neck, her dignity trampled underfoot. But the twisted sadism didn't end there. When the foster sister paraded in, she unleashed a spray bottle of detergent into Hana's face. Then she brandished a scalding iron, poised to sear Hana's delicate features. Finally, when Hana summoned the strength to rise, the foster brother tumbled from his perch, his anguish spurred forth tears. The foster sister, fueled by fury, yanked Hana's hair, dragging her mercilessly toward the front door, and with a cruel kick, sent her tumbling down the steps. But Hana, unbowed by the brutality she had endured, mustered her remaining strength to return, fueled by an indignant fire surging within her. The foster sister found herself on the receiving end of Hana's righteous retribution, Blow after blow rained upon her, each strike delivering a resounding reminder of the unrelenting abuse that had plagued Hana's twisted existence. Then, Hana fled, her pounding footsteps a defiant symphony against the backdrop of her shattered childhood. She retraced her steps to the place where she had set the family cat free, but hope crumbled within her as she discovered his absence. Gazing down the desolate road, clutching onto a thread of optimism, she told herself that salvation would eventually come for her. Then, like a chariot from the heavens, a truck graced the roadside. A figure emerged, apologizing for the wait. But alas, he was a figment of Hana's desperate imagination, a cruel mirage that taunted her fragile spirit. Back in the gloomy confines of the church, Hana's foster mother received an unexpected call from Michiko, who declared her imminent arrival and claimed to be Hana's real mother. The foster father instructed his wife to bring him his shotgun. As morning broke, Hana detected the ominous presence of the firearm. The foster father reached for the weapon, commanding his wife to hide Hana from sight. Then Michiko shattered through the window astride a roaring motorbike, crashing violently upon the table. A collective gasp hung in the air as everyone stood paralyzed. Michiko surveyed the room, her eyes locking onto the foster sister, inquiring if she was Hana. Swiftly, the sister denied the claim, so Michiko's gaze shifted, settling upon Hana, a realization dawning on her through process of elimination. Hana found herself drawn to Michiko's tattoo. Chaos erupted as the foster father discharged his weapon, each shot futilely missing its target. Unfazed by the hail of bullets, Michiko casually posed a weighty question to Hana, inquiring if she truly wished to remain in this forsaken place. Fate now sealed, Hana and Michiko fled their desperate escape becoming a frantic pursuit with the relentless chorus of sirens trailing in their wake. In a harrowing flashback to Michiko's initial arrest, she found herself locked in conversation with a woman she mockingly dubbed Jambo. Little did she know that her sharp tongue would earn her a swift punch to the face from this woman, whose true name was Atsuko. A childish argument ensued, insinuating a shared past between the two, sparking a clash which escalated into a full-blown brawl. Michiko gained the upper hand, brutally kicking Atsuko to the ground and relentlessly pummeling her until the intervention of the guards. As they dragged Michiko back to her cell, their footsteps were interrupted by a news broadcast on a flickering television, detailing the demise of a man named Hiroshi Morenos. Deeply disturbed, Michiko erupted in anguish. Later, Atsuko sped toward the scene of a reported robbery where Michiko allegedly held innocent patrons hostage. Upon arrival, Atsuko discovered a different woman in Michiko's stead. She swiftly subdued the imposter, vowing to administer a fitting punishment for daring to impersonate Michiko. Back within the prison's confining walls, Atsuko presented Michiko with a photograph of Hana, asking if she recognized the girl. Michiko's gaze lingered upon the image. Back in the present, Michiko and Hana trudged along the road's edge, the blazing sun scorching their weary bodies as their fuel reserves dwindled to nothingness. Hana's curiosity urged her to learn more about Michiko, but her inquiries were met with evasive non-answers. Eventually, Michiko halted abruptly and asked Hana to join her beneath a looming water tower. There, Michiko shared a haunting truth, revealing the name of Hana's elusive father, Hiroshi Morenos. A melancholic tenderness seeped through her words, a bittersweet longing for the man who abandoned her, only to meet his demise. But a paradox emerged from the depths of her plea as she sought Hana's help in searching for a dead man, though his death occurred three years prior to Hana's birthday. When Hana pointed out the dissonance, 
It struck a nerve within Michiko, who unleashed a torrent of frustration upon her inquisitive companion. Then she probed Hana's age. Nine years old, Hana reluctantly confessed. In a brazen move, Michiko compelled Hana to bear her tattoo, but Hana firmly refused, determined to protect the fragile boundaries of her identity. At a nearby gas station, Michiko engaged in a heated argument with the cashier, who explained that no fuel remained. But a glimmer of hope emerged from his words, pointing Michiko toward a nearby town where gas could be bought. But there was a catch beneath this silver lining. The town lay three arduous hours away on foot. Stepping back into the unforgiving sunlight, Michiko's desperation took hold, consuming her composure. With reckless abandon, she ferociously plundered a vending machine for a drink. Hana stood transfixed, her innocent eyes wide with disbelief. When Michiko extended a drink to her, she rejected the offer. The weight of their dissension grew heavier, as Hana chastised Michiko for the theft. In response, Michiko hurled her own drink and voiced her protest, but Hana only answered with a request to stop calling her Hana. Her criticism persisted as she scolded Michiko for her littering. Michiko offered to retrieve the shattered glass only if Hana finally unveiled her hidden tattoo. Disheartened by the exchange, Hana rose to leave, eager to distance herself from this brute of a woman. But Michiko's voice called out to her retreating companion, her words faltering upon her tongue. A new name slipped out instead, Hatchin. Inside the ravaged church, the foster father spoke to the police about the search for Hana. As the foster sister made her way towards Atsuko, who'd been put in charge of the investigation, Atsuko sought the telltale tattoo on her stomach from Michiko's photograph to no avail. At that moment, an officer carrying news of Michiko's elusive presence reported to Atsuko, so she ordered everyone to vacate and begin their search. Meanwhile, Michiko and Hachin sought refuge at a restaurant where Michiko divulged disturbing anecdotes. She mistook her lewd reminiscence of her passionate entanglement with Hiroshi as an appropriate conversation topic. Inexplicably, Michiko clung to the belief that Hana was Hiroshi's daughter and presented the weathered baby picture as evidence. Hachin asked what would happen if she lacked the tattoo that bound them together. Michiko responded that she would abandon her. Hachin explained that she bore no such tattoo. Then, on the flickering screen of a television, the news reported on Michiko's prison escape. Suddenly, the bartender's eyes widened with recognition as he noticed Michiko sitting at her table and called the police. Yet Michiko's keen perception did not falter. In a swift act of self-preservation, she silenced him, striking him unconscious. Michiko finally managed to fill the tank of her motorbike. However, before she could make her escape, the police materialized, blocking Michiko's path. Michiko engaged with Atsuko in an argument of childish insults. Then, a figure emerged, Hachin's foster father, beckoning Hachin to come home with him. He spat venomous words, calling her ungrateful. A shiver of fear gripped Hachin, so Michiko embraced her, promising freedom from this hellish ordeal. But Atsuko managed to reach Michiko's vulnerable core with a final childish comment. Michiko, consumed by rage, charged towards Atsuko, pinning her against the hood of her car fingers grasping her tie, abandoning Hatchin on the forsaken bike. Outnumbered, Michiko raised her hands in surrender, whispering a secret to Atsuko, enticing her closer. Then, Michiko sank her teeth into Atsuko's ear, seizing her as a hostage with her own gun. The other officers retreated, leaving Michiko to flee with Hatchin. The foster father laughed as he relished in the revelation that Hatchin's demise would grant him a lucrative insurance payment. A high-stakes pursuit led them through the labyrinthine city streets, where Michiko lost track of Hatchin, who was cornered by her foster father. In a surge of panic, Hatchin tore the wooden cross from around her neck and hurled it at him, enraging him further, his gun now trained on her trembling figure. Yet fortune intervened as Michiko swooped in on her turquoise motorbike, disarming the foster father and sending him hurtling through the roof of a pool bar. Cradling Hatchin in her arms, Michiko provided solace amidst the tears streaming down her cheeks. As they rode into the night, Hatchin confessed to having lied about her tattoo, only to find that Michiko already knew, her understanding woven through their bond, still unbroken.